like to talk today about terraforming and about the ethics of terraforming, which is the whole subject is strange because we're not even going to, or our descendants aren't even going to start doing it for another 500 years. So why are we talking about it so early? Well, the ethics is going to be a big issue, as well as the engineering and the biology of the whole idea. And the ethics, ethics comes from landscapes like this. This is a tour on Dartmoor in the UK, in England, and it just shows that pristine primeval landscapes are really interesting. Most of the hills around here are covered by the stumps of mountains, which we call tours in the UK. Um, they are quite beautiful. They're, they're interesting as you start to climb them and look at them, and some of them actually look like ruined castles from a distance. So they have a level of interest as well as what we call an intrinsic value. Even if there was no grass and no life here, they would still be interesting. And that dwells back on and drives back towards the issue of should we terraform or should we not? And there is a school of thought that says that a pristine landscape like a, a lifeless Mars or a lifeless planet, which we'll discover in the future, has a great deal of value even without life on the surface of that planet, even without an atmosphere. So that, take the great chasm on Mars and the, uh, and the mountains there, they, they have a value and they have an interest level that is independent of life. It's abiotic, if you like. Um, uh, but then we look at landscapes on Earth that are like this and we find that many of them we've actually damaged, say for example Antarctica, where already there is damage to the wildlife occurring there and to the original landscape. So we're not great at leaving stuff alone. Uh, where I am on, on Dartmoor, actually we're fairly close to military ranges. Now we haven't blown these things up, so they're still here. But it's, it's still an issue. How are you going to actually treat a landscape? Um, and you can take instances of wonderful landscapes that people love for their natural value without, without life in them. So the Grand Canyon, and if somebody decided to fill it with trash, people would probably be quite angry. Or the Matterhorn in Switzerland, if somebody decided to mine it and actually destroy it. It's a wonderful spike of a mountain, and its, uh, it's destruction would be very upsetting for people. So how landscapes are treated has a value for virtually everybody. And the whole subject of terraforming is looked upon by some as a matter of hubris and showing off. But there's a very interesting article by uh, Ian Stoner that I found, um, which is more than an article, it's, it's a trial paper, a clinical paper, research paper, and it talks about the reasons for uh, le leaving Mars, for example, in its natural state, or actually terraforming it and turning it into a place where life from Earth can, can live and where potentially our descendants can live. And there are a number of arguments along this line. The first one is that some people have suggested Mars could be used as a mining zone. Well, if you think about it, if you mine a lump of rock on Mars and you want to take it up into, into orbit again, you've got to get it past gravity and the gravity well of Mars, which is going to be very expensive. You've got to have the rocket fuel, you've got to be able to do that. And actually it would be considerably cheaper to mine asteroids or even the moon with its lower gravity. So that argument doesn't really hold water. Um, the next one is a pi the creation of a pioneering spirit and a pioneering colony. Well, again, that's extremely dangerous and extremely difficult on Mars as it is today. Um, it would be a great deal cheaper to set the, the pioneering colony up in the Antarctic, on an ocean, even underground or in the depths of an ocean. And it would be a lot easier to do that. So why do you want to spend a billion when five million would do on the colony on, the, on Earth? So that, again, doesn't really hold water. Um, the other argument is that we use, as a, use Mars as a backup to life on Earth. And I see there's two arguments there. One is that it would be a great deal cheaper to pay for peace conferences to stop people attacking each other with nuclear missiles and to have a, a space defence, asteroid defence system to try and prevent catastrophes like that. 
So that would be cheap. Actually setting it up on Mars as a backup would be very expensive and very uh, take a long time. It might take, you know, if we started doing it in 500 years time, it might take 500 years to actually achieve it. And there's even the, you know, the practical considerations as is Mars big enough to hold an atmosphere that will actually do the job? Is it too small? to actually hold a proper atmosphere that will allow life to exist, or would that atmosphere be constantly constantly blown away? So the practical, practical considerations like that. The only real argument that holds water is research and what we would find out. So I see it as a, a triplicate process, a three-pronged process. The first prong is doing the research on Mars as it is today in a pristine state. A great deal of knowledge could be gained from that, and that might be enough to keep our descendants uh, busy writing research paper, papers and referencing each other's research papers for 500 years. And then there might be a phase when we're actually looking at any life that does already li live on Mars, so if there is life on Mars, working on that. That might take a long time as well, and that might actually overlap with the pristine Mars phase and the research that would be done on that. And then if your decision was made to actually start terraforming a planet, then there would be a great deal of research to do on that as well, of which life forms to add first and what works and what doesn't work. So there's three sources of knowledge there, and each one has its value in its own way. But really, the, one of the issues there is that if you're going to start writing a great collection of research papers on adding life to Mars, well actually if there's humans living on the surface of Mars, they will be adding life whether they like it or not, because we carry, we carry um, life that bacteria and fungi and viruses on our skins and in our intestines. Virtually every part of us is colonised by bacterial life. So if we go to Mars and we find environments where there is liquid water on the surface, or where it's slightly warmer, or we've warmed the planet in some way, then we're going to be introducing life whether we like it or not. So a planned approach to actually terraforming Mars might have more research value than doing it accidentally. So this kind of thing, this tour, does that have value? Yes, it does have value. But you'll also notice that the, the elephant in the room here is I'm surrounded by sedges and grass. So these things do remain, provided you don't destroy them in the process. You could, well, Another example is there is a huge northern basin on Mars which has its own value and will have its own landscapes. If Mars was terraformed, that would probably be turned into an ocean. They'd have to bring the water, most of it, from elsewhere in the solar system, but difficult decisions. Thankfully, it's 500 years too soon to make them, but you can think about it now and see where we go in the future.